had some interesting things to think about lately. I've been dealing a lot with... Okay, so a couple of years ago, there was this big anti-SJW issue, right? Anti-SJWs and SJWs kind of clashed with each other and went at each other and, and people got doxxed and it was a big mess and it was really ugly. I largely stayed out of it at the time. I tried to. I fell on the anti-SJW side of the whole mess. Uh, I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but yeah, I, I kind of fell on the anti-SJW side. Well, I kind of defaulted to not liking Steve Shives because, you know, the anti-SJWs didn't like him. I didn't really know what he did or, or what things people hated about him or whatever. I just heard that he was toxic, heard that he wasn't a great guy and had done some really shady, questionable things. So I just kind of didn't like him. And, and something else I noticed, he, he blocked me on Twitter. In fact, he blocked anybody who followed anybody. Like, he blocked anybody who followed TJ Kirk or Armored Skeptic or just a bunch of different people, a cult of Dusty. And I was included in that list because I followed some of them. I think maybe Logic, too. I was pretty good friends with Logic at the time. Um, back in the early days. And, you know, that kind of got to me. I kind of assumed that the guy was guilty just based on the fact that he blocked me, really, and, and based off of what everybody said about him. Lately, I've kind of felt like... I mean, I, I made this transition from anti-SJW to, to not anti-SJW. No, I'm not an SJW, quote-unquote. I mean, a lot of you guys have seen my videos on feminism and things like that. And you know that I'm not an, an I'm sorry, you know that I'm not an SJW and you know that I'm not an anti-SJW either. I try not to be uh, too far in either one direction because it can get extreme on both sides. But I wanted to take a look at Steve Shives as honestly and objectively as I can and decide if I think the guy is worth disconnecting from because that's kind of what's happened right i mean the entire community basically refuses to talk to him nobody will talk to him he's untouchable he's toxic uh especially in the atheist community especially in the anti-sjw i'm sorry especially in the anti-sjw community nobody wants to talk to him and if you say you're friends with him or you like him then you're automatically labeled as a, a member of the out group so I decided to just take a look at the guy and see what the deal is, as objectively as I can. Now, as far as I can tell, some of the biggest complaints about the guy were that he believes that we shouldn't be addressing certain issues or people or topics. We should just let them die out. For example, we shouldn't be debunking Alex Jones. We should just let it fade to obscurity. That's one of the things that he endorsed as far as I know, I haven't really done heavy research into this. This could be wrong. That's just what I heard about him. He believes that we shouldn't be addressing this because eventually if we ignore it, then it will just, it'll get smaller and smaller. The audience will shrink. By talking about these issues, we're giving it exposure. That's his viewpoint on it. I disagree. I think that generally sunlight is the best disinfectant, typically, in, in most cases. I think that we need to talk about certain ideas to, to give them exposure, to show people this is happening, especially in my market where I talk a lot about extremism and, and people are genuinely damaged by this stuff. They're genuinely hurt. I was hurt by this stuff. You can't just let Jehovah's Witnesses fade to obscurity. They won't. They're growing. It's a lot slower growth than it once was, but it's not zero and it's not negative right now. It's below population growth. I think it's like population growth is like around 1.6% and Jehovah's Witnesses are growing at like 1.3% per year, somewhere in there. But you have to address it. So if, if that is in fact one of Steve Shy's positions, then it's incorrect. He needs to, I would like to see him move over on this subject and maybe realize that that's not the best way to do it. Another complaint I saw was he just, he would rather block everybody, quote-unquote censor people so that they can't criticize him, things like that. I've talked about the fallacy of change before, 
it's a cognitive distortion. In cognitive behavioral therapy, we have this thing called the fallacy of change where, and this should sound familiar to a lot of people who kind of fall on the anti-SJW side, grow thicker skin or or remove yourself from the situation is the bottom line. If somebody says something you don't like, if somebody says the word retard and that upsets you, it's your responsibility to remove yourself from that situation, not my responsibility to make you happy. So you screaming at me for saying that, or, telling, or shaming me, or telling me I shouldn't, or whatever else, I mean, you can tell me that it's not good to use that, but ultimately, your happiness is your responsibility. So it, you have to remove yourself from that situation. That's the bottom line. And I feel like blocking people is how you do that. That's how you remove yourself from a situation. They are Steve Shives, instead of messaging people back and screaming at them for being this thing or that thing, he just blocked them. That simple. He just blocked them before you know, he had any issue with them. I understand why that feels wrong, but he's removing himself from the situation. He is doing what we would do in cognitive behavioral therapy. A therapist would tell him to do that. So if you disagree with his method of doing that, then take it up with modern psychology. Now, there, there, there are concerns. I mean, there is the fact that it, it could cause an echo chamber. And you can see this, I was just talking about this before the podcast with my girlfriend, but you can see this in Jehovah's Witnesses. They shut down criticism immediately. Uh, they, if somebody crashes the Kingdom Hall, quote unquote, if they have an apostate walk into the Kingdom Hall and start yelling out apostate things, they have been instructed and programmed to cover their ears and their eyes and look away. Uh, not not listen to what the person is saying, not even look at them, until the threat is removed from their presence. That is the epitome of an echo chamber. You can't, I mean, if you live in public, if you deal with public people, i.e. if you don't live on a cult compound, that is extreme as it gets as far as making it or creating an echo chamber. Is that what's happening when Steve Shives blocks people? Especially blocks them en masse. He, is he hiding from criticism on social media? Is that, is that the issue? Because I know echo chambers can come in varying degrees, obviously. The most extreme case, like I said, if you still live in public, is like with Jehovah's Witnesses, where they cover their eyes and their ears, and they just... they. They say, la, 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 just don't listen at all. And then there's something as simple and basic as just blocking a person here or there so that you don't have to listen to them say this thing or that thing. You still have to consider. So this is, this is the complicated issue behind this. The fallacy of change says it's your responsibility to remove yourself from the situation. But by removing yourself from that situation... Are you creating an echo chamber for yourself? I think growing thicker skin generally is probably preferable. And, and, and being willing to hear people out, that's preferable uh, to not hearing them out. But if it comes down to just crumbling and falling to pieces and screaming at people or blocking them, I'd rather you just block people. And in Steve Shive's case, he was being uh, addressed by every single atheist YouTuber and every anti-SJW YouTuber, Chris Raygun, Jacqueline Glenn, Sargon of Akkad, everybody, everybody, millions and millions of subscribers turned against this guy. Um, I cannot imagine that his life was easy. I cannot imagine it was easy. It must have been miserable to get at least hundreds of thousands of messages from people I mean, I don't know if they were... I'm sure he's had death threats. I've had death threats, and I'm like the nicest fucking guy alive. If I had death threats, certainly he has. I mean, how many death threats did he get? How many angry, pissed-off people said some really messed-up stuff to him? It's his response... His happiness is his responsibility, so he removed himself from that situation. 
That's what he did. So honestly, I'm having trouble blaming Steve Shives for following the fallacy of change and taking responsibility for his own happiness by removing himself from that situation, by blocking everybody. My viewpoint on this may be incorrect, and I'm willing to hear other people out, and I'm going to be talking to some people tonight about it in more depth. So maybe it'll be refined. Maybe my viewpoint will be refined on this, and I'll change my mind. But at this moment, I don't blame Steve Shives for blocking people at all. I don't think blocking people is wrong at all. Um, and mass is a little concerning, like like Steve did it. But just a few people here or there, I have no issue with that. I have no issue with that. I'll go ahead. I'll take like a couple of questions for the moment. Go ahead. Okay, so Glenn was asking, please tell me you're going to talk about R. Kelly, the R. Kelly interview and his sex cult. I don't actually know anything about his sex cult. I heard that he had women in his uh, basement or something like that. I, I know so little about it. I did see the interview, though. I saw him stand up and freak out like that and, and just, I don't know, like... I, just not knowing the situation at all, I felt bad for the guy because of, you know, it, it felt like it was so real watching him. I don't know if it was real or not, honestly. I guess time will tell. The jury will tell uh, since he's kind of in, you know, he's being charged, I think. I don't know if he's been indicted or not. But anyway, time will tell. We'll see what happens. I try not to prejudge people before we have, you know, enough information on it. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Do you have another question? Uh, for sure. The hockeyist was asking, is there something from your own religion that you supported back then and still support and have your reasons for uh, for supporting change to more secular ones? That is a good question. Um, I'm going to have to think about that one for a second. So are there is there anything that I supported when I was a Jehovah's Witness but I, and that I still support? But and have my reasons for supporting that thing changed? Yeah, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. I mean, I'm sure that that there is something. I'm just gonna have to think about it, and I'll get back to you on that one. PJ was asking, do you think changing history to prove your religion is right? Do I think that altering history to prove my religion is right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, do I think that it's right to alter history to prove my religion? Is that the question? Reworded? Uh, I suppose. No, I don't think that's right. I think that's that's actually not good at all. Um, but they do say that the winners write the history books, don't they? There's no telling what kinds of histories we would have or what kinds of descriptions of battles or events or whatever we would have if Hitler had won World War II, for example, right? I mean, I bet it just would have been just a, a complete train wreck just an awful mess so no i i don't think altering history is right at all or whitewashing history which is something that jehovah's witnesses have done and and a lot of cults do a lot of groups of all sorts do that to try to make the put themselves in a better light so uh, anyway do you have one more for me for sure uh from robot uh what are your views on christianity and its denominations i think that we have roughly 43% of the country who believes that Noah's Ark is a real, literal, true story. And we have about 73% of the country who, who claims to be Christian, who, who self-identify as Christian. Uh, I'm sorry, self-identify as religious, not just Christian, as religious. That 43%, I would consider them to be extremist. That's an extremist viewpoint, that Noah's Ark was a real, literal story. The other 30% or so of the people in the country who are religious but don't adhere to this extremist view, I would like to get them to work with us to get the extremists called out and, and, and not give them a chance to grow anymore especially I would like to get all Christians on my side to fight against the abuses of the Watchtower Society of Jehovah's Witnesses, the abuses of Mormonism, of Seventh-day Adventism, of all of these other groups. I would love to get 
moderate Christians on my side to work against extremists. Uh, and not not really just extremist Christians. Like, I, you know, I don't really address uh, politics very often, but I'm hoping that by talking about extremism in religion, that maybe people will kind of carry that over to other parts of their lives. It hasn't necessarily proven to be that way in the past, but one can hope. Okay, let's take a look at this Dare to Share stuff. So turns out that my girlfriend was actually a member of Dare to Share. So out of curiosity, I'd never heard of it. I asked some other people if they had ever heard of it, and I did turn up some, some interesting results. Uh, so we're going to have some people on the podcast tonight who were members of Dare to Share. So I figured we would kind of go through their website. I found out that a lot of people actually don't know what Dare to Share is. Uh, so I figured I, I'd, I'd kind of go through the website, take a look at it, and discuss what it is. As far as I can tell, out of the research that I've done, it's a non-denominational, evangelical, youth pastor, material supplier. I know that's a big, long, complicated name. It's pretty much just this company that supplies uh, materials, articles, books, things like that for churches and their youth pastors and things like that. Uh, where Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, and Mormons both produce their own materials. But Jehovah's Witnesses have the Watchtower and the Awake and all of their tons of books. They've got Pure Worship of Jehovah and How Did We Get Here Through Evolution or Creation and the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures all kinds of different materials that they print every year, uh, and Mormons do the same thing. But a lot of smaller churches don't have the funds to produce materials like that themselves. So what they'll do is they'll go to Dare to Share, and Dare to Share, being kind of non-denominational, will supply them with these materials. And it actually gets really extreme sometimes. So I figured we'd just kind of go through some of this. Yeah, some of the people on, on this website that we're looking at here, these are like bands, like Christian bands and things like that. Uh, it's really, really extreme. And apparently Dare to Share, as far as I understand it, now if I get some of this wrong, forgive me, I'll be talking to some guests about it tonight. They can correct me when the time comes, but... I believe they have like basically conventions or assemblies similar to Jehovah's Witnesses where you all crowd into a giant arena and they rile you up and get you all excited and, you know, pass out these materials and all this other stuff. And apparently it's, from my understanding, really common to call it dare to scare because it's kind of a kind of a fruit loopy, scary kind of thing. But uh, anyway, yeah, so I figured we'd take a look at some of the articles that they have on this website. They've got some really interesting ones here. Let's just take a quick glance at five conversation starters to bring up the gospel online. So they're all about bringing up Jesus at every opportunity. Now, most of you know I have no issue with Jesus. I have no issue with Christianity generally. I have a problem with extremism. And this is an extremist program, period. This is an extremist program. It, they produce extremist materials. So let's take a look. Five gospel conversation starters. One, experiencing God's forgiveness in my own life challenges me to be less judgmental of others because dot, dot, dot. So that's, this is the conversation starter to bring up gospel online. So presumably you'll be saying this to somebody you meet online. Uh, here's number two. Here's why I know I'll go to heaven after I die, dot, dot, dot. Oh, God, can you guys imagine hearing this from somebody? It's like the most pretentious thing ever. My youth group is doing blank this week. Come join us. And then four, my personal relationship with Jesus made a difference in my life this week by dot, dot, dot. God, it's awful. Number five, the most hopeful thing in my life is dot, dot, dot. What do you put your hope in? And of course, you're supposed to say some kind of Jesus shit. The most hopeful thing in my life is Jesus or some stupid thing. What do you put your hopes in? Ugh, God, it's awful. Try posting one or more of these yourself on your own social media as you challenge your students to do likewise. 
Okay, because it's kind of a youth pastor thing, I guess. Ask them to come back to youth group the next week, ready to share what they did and what gospel conversations came out of their posts. This is keeping people indoctrinated deeply. It's so scary, honestly. It's scary. Okay, I've got another article here. Let's take a quick glance at this one. By the way, I think I'm going to be taking guests a little bit late, maybe 9.35, FYI. So this next article is called Eight Great Summer Outreach Ideas. Let's take a look at their eight great summer outreach ideas. Number one, organize a student outing to a local park and challenge each of your Christian teenagers to initiate at least one faith-sharing conversation with a stranger. For help with this, have your students download the Life in Six Words app. Huh. I bet the Life in Six Words app is probably another Dare to Share thing. I like another Dare to Share sponsored whatever. And then two is designate an ice cream outreach month where you challenge every Christian in your group to treat one unreached friend to ice cream one-on-one with the expressed purpose of using the time to initiate a faith-sharing conversation. Ugh. Then close out your month with a youth group ice cream social that students can invite their friends to and give the gospel. This is extreme. This isn't just like, this isn't normal. If you think that this is normal behavior, then you should take a step back and analyze how you grew up and why you think that this is normal. It's not. It's not normal at all. Number three, plan a trip to the amusement park or swimming pool and challenge every student to initiate at least one faith-sharing conversation with a stranger. See, this is, this is proselytizing. Um, this is like going out and knocking on doors, kind of. I consider knocking on doors the most extreme of the extreme. Like, Jehovah's Witnesses do that. It's extreme. Mormons do that. If you're not one of those two denominations and you're knocking on doors or proselytizing publicly in some other way, like, like they're describing here, that's extreme. I remember looking at... Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Steve Anderson. I've debunked him on my channel once or twice. He's the leader of a cult. I forget what it's called now. Um, let me just look it up real quick. Uh, Steve, It's Faithful Word Baptist Church. That's what it is. Could not remember for the life of me. This is a cult. Faithful Word Baptist Church is a cult. It's not as bad as Westboro Baptist Church, but it's up there. It's real extreme. And this guy is a cult leader. Um, and they proselytize, too. They go knocking on doors. They call it soul winning. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the last video I did of him was him talking about how... You know what? I did a video with him and Cirrus the Skeptic. Um, he was on my channel. Pretty nice guy. But anyway, it was... Before that, it was him talking about how they keep getting the police called on them. But ultimately, they don't care. They're going back to those areas anyways, even though the police told them not to because they're they're... Their boss is God, not the police. So then we've got uh, number four on this. Plan a community service project. This could be anything from a canned food drive to hosting a free car wash. No strings attached. Okay, no strings attached. Period. End of sentence, right? Except there's more to this one. Share the gospel with everyone you interact with. Oh, so it isn't no strings attached. I have to listen to you try to push Jesus down my throat the whole goddamn time. It's something that really bothers me about those types of community service projects is the fact that they expect people to... So they'll do things like homeless outreach. So they'll give sandwiches to the homeless or something like that. And that's nice. That's a good thing, right? But it's like holding it hostage. Like you have to sit through uh, this talk or this, this sermon before getting the sandwich. You're holding it hostage almost. And that's kind of what's happening here. I mean, they said no strings attached, so they'll probably wash the car anyways. But still, why do I have to listen about Jesus? Can't you just do outreach? Why do you have to talk about... Why do you have to set up this outreach so that you can talk about Jesus? Come on. And then number five, plan an outreach movie night. For help with this, click here. I'm good. Recruit your teenagers to volunteer at your church's VBS. I'm not sure what a VBS is. Maybe somebody can tell me when... Uh, when I unmute them, like when the guests come on. 
and challenge them to specifically connect with any kids who aren't from your church so they can share the gospel with them. I actually talked about this with my girlfriend, and she told me what VBS was. I forget what it is now, though. Maybe she can tell me. Model an, evan- I'm sorry, model an evangelistic lifestyle yourself by using the summer months to pray for and connect with your neighbors who don't know Jesus. Invite neighbors over for a barbecue or dessert night. Challenge your adult leaders to do the same. Then come to youth group and share stories about your own faith-sharing efforts. This is self-indoctrination here is what's happening. Uh, People self-indoctrinating. That's what these materials are intended to do is keep people indoctrinated. Keep them around like-minded people. Keep the conversations going about the subjects that will keep them indoctrinated. Because the moment it gets unplugged, typically, uh, people tend to start to wake up and see what they were doing is, is not logically consistent. So finally, we've got number eight here. Lay the groundwork this summer with next year's student leadership team by, di- um, wait, by discipling them weekly during these summer months and casting a vision for their role so together you can hit the ground running in the fall for an active, growing gospel advancing youth ministry. I'll tell you this. One thing that that churches really have an edge on is indoctrination and, and, and is getting people really empowered and riled up and and motivated. They are good at it. Okay. Last year at Faithless Forum, that Faithless Forum was the first time that I had ever really been I think maybe the first time I met Holy Kool-Aid and Genetically Modified Skeptic and others, right? It, I, I, it may have been the first time I met them. Really nice guys. They're like my best friends. Uh, Mr. Atheist is actually Mr. Atheist. I probably talk to him the most out of any YouTubers at this point. But Holy Kool-Aid and GM Skeptic, just awesome dudes. Love them to death. Um and something I discovered was at Faithless Forum, I got to listen to them talk I, publicly. I got to listen to them give speeches publicly for the first time. Thomas Westbrook, or Holy Kool-Aid, he was a youth pastor. He is the best public speaker I have ever heard in my life. I mean, I've been to events, I've been to talks, I've been to conventions, I've heard Salman Rushdie I've heard Dan Barker and all of them, and Thomas Westbrook is the best. He is the best. I could only aspire to be as good as him with public speaking, honestly. And I have to say, I think that that's because he was a youth pastor, at least partially. He was, I don't know if he was following these specific materials, but this is the type of thing he would do. And for Faithless Forum, he's been he's a board member with me. We're both board members. He's been throwing out youth pastor ideas to get people motivated. Like, for example, we didn't end up doing this last year, but he suggested tie a balloon to everybody's ankle. And you're, so everybody in the room is supposed to try to pop everybody else's balloon by the end of the day. So the, the person... The people who still have balloons or the last person to have a balloon intact on their leg gets a prize or something like that. Uh, Those types of activities are kind of icebreakers and community building. He's just so good at what he does, like to a ridiculous degree. Uh, He really knows how to get people uh, mobilized. And that's really what they're trying to do here is get people mobilized and get, they're trying to teach people how to, um, how to keep people interested in Jesus with this. That's what they're doing. So it's a little bit startling, honestly. So this article is called Nine Practical Ways to Multiply. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Let's find out. Then uh, the first one, it says, pray, pursue, and persuade. As much as we want our students to be disciple makers, it really starts with us. We need to make, uh, so this is being written to youth pastors, for example. We need to make disciples out of our students by praying, pursuing, and persuading them with the truth of Christianity and the joy of following Jesus. 
As we continue to set the example of what discipleship looks like, in turn, they will be able to replicate the process. A helpful way of doing this is by adopting the cause circle in your youth ministry strategy. I'm wondering what that is. The cause circle. Oh, God, it's a video. Okay. Prayer, care, share. (laughs) God, I love it. Here's how it works. Prayer. It all starts with prayer. Jesus often took time away so he could be alone with his father in prayer. And then we got care. Jesus also modeled how important it is to care for people's needs. Jesus often healed the sick, feed, uh, fed the hungry, and helped the hurting. He cared for the whole person, not just their spiritual needs. And then we got share. After prayer and care, we m- God, they love rhyming, don't they? After prayer and care, we must lovingly share the gospel message clearly and confidently. Ugh. See, this is one of the things that bothers me about the 12-step program. By the way, uh, I went to school for substance abuse counseling. The 12-step program is total bullshit. Do not do the 12-step program. Find a secular program to go through. The last step, the 12th step in the 12-step programs is spread the gospel of Jesus to everybody. That's bullshit. Don't even get me started. I've done a video on it. I'll do another one of these days. Anyway. Okay, so pray, pursue, and persuade. That was the first one. Then two, be authentic. Present your best self to the world. Just don't be fake. Students won't want you to be, I'm sorry, students want you to be an authentic person. They desire it. Being authentic is another way of being open with how God made you. Ugh, it's awful. Okay, number three, know your limits. Well, it is ministry, is one of the most common statements I hear from burnt out or nearly burnt out ministers and youth leaders. Every youth leader struggles with taking care of him or herself. Okay, so they're saying just don't burn out. That is important in anything. You don't want to burn out. That's why I've talked about maybe going down to one video per month. I'm not burned out right now. This is my absolute favorite thing to do, and I consider myself so lucky to be able to do this for a living but I don't want to burn myself out. So I'm trying to find ways to reduce my workload so that I have a longer runway so I don't burn out. Okay, so number four is find the right leaders. A discipleship multiplication strategy is hinged on finding the right kind of leaders. Leaders are the ongoing glue for your ministry. They help cascade your vision to the students and reinforce the culture that you're trying to establish. Interesting. Number five is jump on social media. Before social media was around, knowing what your students were up to after they left youth group, it's a bit of a mystery. Oh, that's interesting. So they're encouraging spying on others. Social media is a great way to model gospel advancement by keeping up with your students. That's not good. That's, that's bad. That's, a, that's one step down the wrong road. Number six, take pride in your youth room. Not everyone, including me, has a large enough budget to deck out a youth room. But while having a stellar youth room isn't essential, it's important to take pride in your space. After all, many of your students are encountering God for the first time in your youth room. Okay. Is it a, like, I guess it's a spiritual experience to encounter God for the first time. I don't know. I feel like there's a a not safe for work joke in there somewhere. Uh, Number seven, plan catalytic events. Catalytic events like a back-to-school bash, fall festival, or dare-to-share events are great ways to draw in outside teenagers. It shows them that Christians aren't as uptight as people paint us to be, and it gives them an opportunity to experience God in an unconventional or atypical way. Yeah, um, actually a lot of Christians are uptight. A lot of them are. In fact, these guys are uptight too but they're trying to paint themselves as not uptight. That's really the difference. And it's actually a good strategy uh, for the sake of bringing new people in. It's a good strategy to kind of be cool or whatever. Then we've got eight. Actually, let me just take a quick glance at this events thing here. Dare to change the lives of teenagers through evangelism-focused youth ministry events. Nah, I'm good, thanks. Anyways, though. Uh, And then... Number eight was hang out with your students. Hang out, hang out, hang out. Did I mention hang out with your students? They're trying to absorb the, you know, every moment, every free second of these kids' time. They're trying to get them heavily involved in this whole process. That's the goal here. If they don't have any free time to think to themselves, really, uh, they're less likely to find opposing information. They're less likely to go off and do some critical thinking, that kind of thing. 
Here's number nine. Baptize everything in prayer. Okay. Ministry takes hard work, but it's, but it also requires the Spirit of God to move in our ministry. Baptize all of your efforts in prayer. Ask God to give you the strength to work toward his glory. Pray with, ex, um, with expectancy as you try to fulfill his kingdom here on earth. God needs to be the fuel behind your ministry because he's the one who changes hearts. Make sure you are programming prayer. Programming prayer. Dedicates more time to announcements than to prayer. What do you think might happen if you tried to change that? Groans, whining, revolts, as in voting with their feet? Regularly folding prayer into your group programming can feel risky. Oh, I see. So they're, they're planning out segments where they pray. That's basically what it is. It's a, a risk worth taking if you're serious about increasingly becoming a gospel advancing ministry. Okay. Well, anyway, that's that's kind of the Dare to Share website. Those are the types of articles you find. It's it's a youth pastor program designed to teach people, teach te- you know, older teens, 16, 17, 18, 20, how to be youth pastors, to encourage and motivate and mobilize young kids like between the ages of six and 15 that kind of thing as far as i can tell the first guest that i had was bun bun are you there can you hear me get comfortable and my cat decides to pull the oh they do that all the time yeah so okay uh, there's one thing you're kind of wrong in that it's um it's not it's supposed to train the youth pastors. Yeah, the website mm-hmm. itself is for that, but the events itself are to get younger kids, usually ages 12 to 15, to tell all of their friends about God. 12 to 15. Okay. So, yeah, uh, just to start out here, we've never talked before, right? Except, I mean, nope. we, not on the podcast. So, you have a history with this, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> What and what is it exactly? That, hmm? Can you tell me what it is? I, I'm kind of unclear on it still a little. All right. Uh, it's really bizarre. I remember being really excited the first time I went. I was finally in the more uh, older versions of in the youth classes in church. Um, and I was able to go somewhere without my mom because it was like 45 minutes away from where I lived. Mm. And so you go there and the beginning part is you get to have like you get like jokes there's usually a guy who's who tells like comedy stuff sometimes while he's talking about it you get like music the first few days first few bits and then it starts leading you into what you're supposed to be learning okay. and they'll have the occasional break okay and so then the it's... following day mm-hmm. they'll have you do even more until like 12 and then they send you out <clears throat> into the city to go door to door to people asking for canned goods, which I'm okay with that part. Like that, I was like okay with. But they gave like this thing of like you must at least uh, try to get at least two people to God amongst your group, oh. at least amongst the group. And how many people usually go out with the group? Um, there are for me there was about eight people that went. Um, from my church itself, from other churches, there's like 20, 30 people. There were some churches that had like f- full like sections that were just purchased for them, for wow. their students. That's super crazy. Okay. So they like dress up in weird clothing and I'm just like, no. <laughs> right. So it's like, a, I guess you would call it like a, it's an event that you go to like a big arena, right? And they're probably like yes. five to 10,000 people or something like that. Or? Yeah, they'd use arenas or they'd use the mega churches. We okay. use this one in Denver. I'm pretty sure that Struck and I went to the same one. Or did she really? Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, because we were talking about how one in Denver and we're talking about the fire and brimstone one. And it's like, mm. you went to this one? Oh, that's Wait a so funny. Yeah, okay. So for people who don't know, that would be my girlfriend uh, struck by lightning, and she went to Dare to Share. I'm going to be talking to her next. That's really crazy. Um, I would like to talk with her along so we can b- bounce off like there before I we have to We can probably go. do that. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, – I'll mute you for a minute, then I'll talk, get her th- little thing on it, and then we can all three talk in uh, yep. like near the end. 
if that works for you. Yeah, that that sounds perfect. So it, it sounds to me like they start out with fun and games and things like that, and then it moves to something a lot more serious. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, it it does. Like you'd get um, like the party stuff. Like the one that reminded well, the the one that. I remember vividly was when the new Marvel movies were coming out mm. and they stu- they did a superhero theme and it was the cheesiest thing I'd oh. ever seen. Isn't it and always it was on like cheesy a, with Jesus? Like a comedy skit type thing. And then as you would continue going there would, they would start with the whole, what if your friends uh, don't accept Jesus? They, they believe this stuff and they believe in all these other um, outer worldly creatures, but they don't believe in God. Are you uh, going okay. to want them to go to hell? And it's like, um... So they're talking about like the Marvel characters. Like what if your friends believe yeah. in the Marvel characters, but not God? Yes. Oh, that's so bad, isn't it? <laughs> what What did you think of it when all that was happening? Like you, you um, still that- believed it, right? Yeah, um, uh, I was actually like questioning when I was like 13 because I was like, here, I'm actually bored during church. This is boring as heck. Yeah. And I went through the Bible. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Right. <laughs> but I went still because I'm like, okay, I got to be the good Christian daughter. Sure. And I remember wholeheartedly the during the uh, super – so touching on the concept of like gay superheroes that were talking like media at that time – feeling horrible and praying to the point where I'm crying and all my youth pastors are like around me praying right. on me to not be gay. They knew. So I guess you told them that you had these feelings no, or whatever? No, they or? didn't know. But I just like, because I'd known that I was gay from like eight. Okay. And like, I was like praying so hard, sobbing, shaking, mm. crying to like, I remember desperately asking and they asked like what it was that i was praying about i'm like i don't want to talk about it yeah. and they're like okay yeah we're pretty sure you, it'll be fine god will have you still gay mm. yeah that's that's really really heartbreaking that they put people through that you know it, it's the, so sad the main one though that got to me and i'm getting a little bit shaky because yeah. uh during one of them i don't know if struck went to this one but they were talking they had a rape victim talking Oh, God. And uh, mind you, I was at the time, I was 17, and I was sat next to the guy who raped me for three months. God. And um, I ended up listening, and they said that the reason that the girl there was raped, that she personally believed that she was raped, to help other ki- uh, other women and men who of were course. raped. Of course. Like, after her. So the sole reason that it happened to her was so that she could help ones that it happened to as well. What I'm sitting here doing? like, okay, so apparently that's the reason that I was raped. God's like, here, you're going to get raped to help other people. Instead Seriously. of why not stop the rape. So you were, you said you're about 17? Yeah, I was 17. Yeah, that's a good point. Why didn't he just stop it? Couldn't he have just stopped yeah. it? He could stop all of them, couldn't he? Yeah, he could have stopped mine. <laughs> it's just so hard. He went to the same church as I did. It was... It makes me sick. Ugh. Well... I mean, I'm glad that you did end up finding your way out. I'm glad that you finally kind of accepted who you are because that's just something that you don't need to yeah. hide. I've been 2010. You know? Say again. So I've been out. I've been out since 2010. Okay, so nine years then, roughly. Yeah. Very nice. That's awesome. I'll tell you what. I'm going to mute you for the moment, and then I'm I'm going to talk okay. to Struct, and I'll unmute you near the end there. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Let me. Uh, yeah. That's so heartbreaking. Like. I don't know how they can justify this. What is going through their heads that makes them think it's okay to to say any of this? Anyway, actually, Struct, it uh, looks like you're already unmuted. Are you with me? Yep, I'm here. So tell me about your experience with it. Uh, I really don't know a whole lot about it. Did your church get, like, materials mostly, or did they do the events, or was it both? We did a little bit of both. Um, our our church was actually one of the churches that rented out the entire section because we had so many people from there who went. Wow. Um, we would have, yeah, we'd have like 40 to 50 people. We'd have to rent buses. Um, and they, we, we did go to the one out in Denver. And then there was also um, later on, there was one cl- closer to home that we went to um, in future years. Okay. So there were, they held them at different uh, areas, I guess. Uh, one of right. them was closer to where you were originally. Yeah. So basically, 
the way I understand it is that once a year, all across the country, um, there are hundreds of different like arenas and what have you yeah. where everyone goes to and it all happens on the same day. Um, so the arena that they might choose or the mega church that um, they might choose to host at um, could change depending on the year. Um, so, for example, one year we had one in an auditorium that was here in town. We went out to Denver, you know, things like that. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So what was it like when you got there? Like, what happened? Uh, what was kind of the progression of events? Well, when we got there, it, it felt like really energized because you have a whole bunch of kids, like, all in the same area. You know, we're all feeding off of each other's energy. And honestly, it started off a little bit like a concert. Like, they had the music. They had the lights. They it had like the same, it was the same feeling that you would get at a concert feeling like, um, you're a part of something bigger, you know, whether it's the music or, you know, what have you, sure. cause they haven't actually gotten to the sermons yet, but, um, after they go through and do all the music, then they sit you down for like these videos and these sermons and these talks. And, you know, honestly, I remember bits and pieces of them, but I was so young. Mm. Um, it's hard to remember all of them. But what I do remember is specifically the actions that they made me take. Like um, one year, one year, basically, um, they were talking about if you don't reach out to your friends and family and t tell them about Jesus, then it's partly your fault if they go to hell. Right. Um and then they would have people pull out their phones and text, you know, their friends and family or call them and basically say, I love you, but you're going to hell if you don't come to church with me. That's not good. Holy and shit. Yeah. They made me do that for my father. That's not fucking good. So what, how did you feel about it at the time? Like what was going through your head? Are you, how do you feel about it now? I feel horrible about it now. Like I, yeah. I told my own father he was going to hell. Like that yeah. doesn't sit well with anybody. But at the time I was more just scared because, oh God, if I don't get my dad to come to church, then he he's going to hell and he's going to like be tortured for eternity and it will be my fault. Yeah. yeah. They, they prey on the... They, they prey on the innocence of the kids and the fears that kids have, and they use it to their advantage. Yeah, it's disgusting, the tactics that they use. And I've seen, um, you know, a lot of similar tactics among a lot of kind of high control groups. It's it's something called undue influence. Uh, Stephen Hassan talks about it where, you know, a, a kid can say until they're blue in the face that it's their choice that, to get baptized at eight years old, but is it actually their choice? Do they really understand the con the the consequences of their actions? You know, it, it's they can't possibly at that age have a concept of what they're doing or or the consequences of what they're doing. So, I don't, I wouldn't personally blame you for any of that. I would one hundred percent blame Dare to Share for all of that. Every part of that was their doing and their plan and their fault. I, I get where you're coming from. It's still just hard to like come to terms with the fact that I may have been young, but that was an action that you know yeah. I did take, whether or not I was under the influence of the event or what have you. Yeah. It's still something that I have terms with, and it's horrible. Yeah, I can't even imagine. It sounds awful. But I'll tell you what, uh, if you want, I can actually go ahead and unmute uh, Bun Bun here, and we can talk a little bit with her. Does that sound good to you? I'm down. Okay, let's see. Are you there? Can you hear me, uh, Bun Bun? Hey. Uh, oh, my God, Struck. The moment you said the whole phone calls, I was like, oh, my God. I completely morphed that out of my brain. It was so horrifying. Did, what happened with yours? Did, did that happen Um, <clears throat> I remember specifically messaging a, a girl that I had a crush on um, who was into witchcraft. Uh-oh. And just telling her that if she doesn't like come to God, she doesn't listen to what I had to say or the Bible that she was going to go to hell and it ended up breaking up a friendship. That's a shame that happens. I mean, people it's kind of disgusting to me how people take advantage of others like that um, in the name of Jesus. 
You yeah, know? the moment Strucker um, said about how she had the, they brought the phones, and I was like, oh, geez, no, nostalgia, pain. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that I'm, I imagine that's probably painful. So, um, you wanted me to tell the just to to liven this up because we're kind of in a really really dark mood. Um, sure. I found <laughs> you sold me to message it to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I realized that I was attracted to girls in leather during the. Um, the one where they had the fire and brimstone one where it had the letter from hell right i don't remember if you remember it struck but there was like uh, a a soul a person sitting in the middle and there was a really really tall decked out like he's going to an evanescence concert guy and then a girl in like a, a leather skirt and a halter top and leather boots and i'm sitting here going oh my god i'm so gay that's oh god no i don't remember that like i remember the superhero one and i remember like the, the whole like, one yeah and then um like you know through your friends are all going to hell one but yeah i just specifically remember like i can see it in my head like the lights were all off it was like a bluish purple light that was being shown on and they were talking to his ear and i'm just sitting here going her legs though oh god <laughs> although you did you did bring up a really interesting point just a couple minutes ago about how like the the whole event basically makes these kids um have a giant superiority or superiority oh. complex regarding yeah. christianity like it, it convinces them that they are the right ones and that they yeah have responsibility to bring people to jesus and it, it made the because the church i was in the the there were clicks there were so many clicks and I felt involved for once there, but even after it, it was just, oh, we were able to save this many souls. We, you weren't able to talk. You, you stumbled over your words. It's your fault. So you're saying you it, it was almost like a, a, a tally, like whoever wins the most souls. Oh, yeah, because I stumbled over my words. I had social mm. anxiety, I, all Same. of this. And when they would, like, get mad or, like – grab their dog and like have them like bark at us one person grabbed a gun uh it was my fault yeah and a another friend of mine that were at like the lowest of the low because we were really we didn't know how to talk to people we were the nerds the the ones that got made fun of at schools yeah you were the christians <laughs> i mean everybody yeah. makes fun of the christians like no there, there, there was the, actually they were a group of popular christians we were the nerd geek okay sit in the corner get made fun of with uh, wedgy Christian. Right, yeah. I was actually kind of... No, you know, I wasn't that kind. I was, like, an <laughs> ultra-Christian, though. Um, oh, no. Yeah, so everybody just knew I was Jehovah's Witness, and it was weird, but middle school sucked for me. But by the time I got to high school, everybody knew me, and I had, you know... I, I didn't really make friends with anybody, really, but I knew everybody. It was like acquaintances with everybody. So to be entirely honest, better. if I ever had to repeat a grade, I would choose any grade but during middle school. Yeah, middle school is so awful. Middle for schoolers me. are. Mm. I know they're <laughs> See, bad. See, I right? kind of fell on the opposite side of, of where you did Bun Bun. I was like yeah. the, I I was the girl who hung out with like the cheerleader. Like we were all like super Christian, and um, or at least like before I was about sixteen or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. But basically, I I generally knew how to talk to people. So like when we went to like door to door, like collecting cans, goods, and all that. I mean, it was it was fine for it was fine for me. I was me, totally like, but okay was... with collecting the canned goods, but then it was like, you get there, but no, it's more important if you save the souls instead of feeding hungry kids. Right. And... Yeah, and but like it was like the whole saving souls thing that I was like perfectly okay with because with my church, um, we were basically instructed like you make friends with people so that you can bring them to church. So I like grew up like with that whole mindset and it's like a fucked up mindset to grow up with. Like it the really only is. reason you're making friends is so that you can bring them to church. I, I think that that's one. also part of why I stopped making friends. Uh, it, actually after having to do the phone call, I stopped making friends and I stopped caring at like at all about anything because I didn't want to lose any more friends. Yeah. God, those it, phone calls it, really messed us it up. It hit my depression hard. Like I ended up losing like all of my friends over this and I just stopped caring. Yeah. That, I stopped caring about everything. That's that that's what it'll it do. It really you. messed with my depression yeah. and yeah. Well, I mean, how are you doing now though? Do you feel like you're in a better uh, place now than you were then? Yes and no. Um it was really awkward coming out to my it was 
harder to come out to my mother that I was an atheist than I was a lesbian. Really? That that bad, huh? Really. And I, I'll tell you about it later if you want. Or okay. it's, it's a really – I'd like to like verbally tell you about it because I think you'd find it really interesting. Well, I, I, and how I'm down to listen to it, it but I don't know if you would want to tell it. Do you want to tell it here? No, I'm fine. Oh, okay, you can tell me then if you want. Okay. Now? If you want, it's up to you. Okay. <laughs> I was confused. Um, <clears throat> well, basically, it <clears> – <throat> probably wasn't the best time but i kind of panicked yeah. because she was like bringing here asking me to pray and i'm just like mom i'm an atheist mm. and she just started bawling yeah. and saying how selfish i was how terrible of a daughter i was yeah. how much i was betraying her out of all the fact that she accepted me as being gay and that she was okay and t saying agreeing that like God made you that way, mm. that I wasn't going to continue and be in heaven with her. Oh, yeah. So it, it's, I guess she kind of flipped it on you. It's your fault, right? Yeah. That, yeah. I know. Um, my mom kind of did a similar thing. She said that we, as in my, me and my, my siblings, we left her behind. Uh, you yeah. Know, and it's our fault. I was like, fault. why are you, this is me. So, so you're only, it, it really hurt me, but we, things have been a bit better where, the whole concept that, oh, so you were only okay with me being gay because you thought I was still a Christian. Yeah. Wow. So she was okay with you being gay at first. Yeah. It was. It was the funniest thing. We. Uh -huh. I was in the doorway, and um, a friend of mine was like, "You gotta tell her." And I'm like, "No." And I was sitting there folding laundry, and she's like, "Okay, <clears throat> what is it that you guys are talking about?" I'm like, "Yeah." yeah. She's like, no, tell me. And I'm like, I, it's something you might kick me out for. Yeah. And she's she puts the towel down and I'm kind of sort of a lesbian. She just stared at me for ten minutes. Oh man! And I swear, her voice. I thought you were gonna tell me you were doing drugs. Oh God, really? And I'm like, I don't go anywhere. That's crazy. Okay, so it it, it was better than it could have been then, roughly when you mm -hmm. announced that. All right, that's not so bad. But she just lost it when you told her you were an atheist. Yep. That is a shame. Do you still have like an okay relationship with her now? Or? Yeah, we're pretty good. We just don't ever bring up the topic of religion. That's lucky. Ever. If I do and I start quoting the Bible, she gets really mad, especially when I said it was kind right. of the Bible that made it to where I'm not a Christian. What kind of? What was like? What's your relationship with your mom uh, struck? What was that all about? Okay, so I don't talk with my mom about religion at all either. Yeah. She knows I'm an atheist and. Um, for the longest time, like back when I was still in high school, like she was telling me, you're going to come back eventually. You're going to see like the, the lights. But um, she's kind of laid off of that a little bit. Recently. Yeah, same. Yeah. But um, anymore, like that's just the topic that we avoid completely. I've gotten her to talk to me about it a little bit just over the past couple months. But it's one of those things where we know it's going to cause a giant fight if we talk too much about it. So it's. It's a no-go zone. Well, I I guess it, it's a good thing that you've kind of found a happy medium, right? That where you can kind of have a relationship yeah. and not have to worry about it for both of you, actually. Yeah, and then oh, geez, I'm sitting here, and the thing is, is that I'm so happy, but yeah. I, I gotta say this a little bit quieter. Um, my uh, si the my the sister, uh, not the oldest of my younger, younger sisters. You can actually say it as quiet as you want. I'll just no, I, the I can't because my mom's in the other room. Yeah, yeah, you um, just say it real. The quiet, older like of that. my uh, my sisters, yeah, is agnostic, uh -huh. and my younger sister is like the youngest the baby sister is um pretty much there as well leaning okay. towards the atheist side okay. and i'm so happy but i'm like don't tell mom because i know as soon as they figure mom they find out it's gonna get blamed on me oh, that sucks. but you know yeah that's true but if you think about it it may be uh, something of a more i don't know it may be beneficial in its own way if she did happen to find out because Maybe you could be like a united front together almost. You know, the more people come it, out. It, the... I would end up getting kicked out. Really? You think? That's, worse. that's a shame. And I have mental illnesses that make it impossible. I would, If I ever got kicked out, I would probably die. Mm, that's not good. All right. Well, <laughs> play it safe then, I guess. And yeah. I, uh, I actually I appreciate both of you coming on and talking to me about this. been super interesting. I'm going to go ahead and move on. But uh, again, uh, I'll probably talk to you guys later on, okay? Anyway, yeah, thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's been really, really interesting conversation. 
And I'm glad I could bring some light to this. I'm hoping to do a full-blown video on it sometime in the near future. But I will uh, go ahead and get off here, and I will talk to you guys next week.